Good morning. Seems like moving a bus. <laughs> Me neither, Kyle. But Gary told me I needed to wait a little bit of time, so okay. We did it. Alright, um, we are starting in chapter 2 of Habakkuk. A little uh, recap of chapter 1. Habakkuk asked the Lord, how long will you let this present condition continue? There is violence everywhere, people are wicked, and you don't seem to be doing anything. And God answers Habakkuk and says, oh, brother, just wait, because I'm going to do something you're never going to believe. And God's answer to him is, I'm going to send the Chaldeans. They're even worse than the people you're living with. And I'm going to use them for judgment. And Habakkuk looks and he has a hard time understanding how God can take a nation like the Chaldeans and bring judgment upon Israel. And he is wondering. And the last thing he says, and this is where I'm going to start this morning, is turn with me to Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1. So there's a dialogue going back and forth between Habakkuk and God. God's telling him, this is the answer to your question. Habakkuk goes, I don't understand your answer. <laughs> And then Habakkuk says this, and I love how he writes this, because you've got to give Habakkuk credit. His faith was strong, and he never doubted the character of God. He didn't understand God's ways, but he did understand God. Amen. And he knew that God was love. <coughs> okay? And so Habakkuk says in verse 1 of chapter 2, I will stand my watch and set myself on the ramparts, which is a very high place, and you can look out. And he says, and I'm going to watch and see what he will say to me. That's God. And what I will answer when what? I am corrected. When I am corrected. <coughs> you understand, Habakkuk didn't understand what God was doing, but he knew God well enough to know that what God was going to do was the right thing. Amen. And so he says, I'm going to wait and I'm going to watch to see what he says to me when I am corrected. you got to love that. Now, there was nothing wrong with him not understanding God's plan. God didn't rebuke him because he didn't understand it, or that he had questions. What sets Habakkuk apart is that he lived by his faith. Amen. He trusted that God's character was what he thought it was. That God's character was what he read it was. That God's character was what he knew it was as he was talking with God. Have you ever thought, how can mortal understand the divine? How can sinful flesh understand perfection? Do you ever wonder how Jesus dealt with us on a day-to-day -day basis? How many of you get frustrated with people? Oh, yeah. Keep your hands up, because I want to make sure I'm not alone. Look around, see? Good. There were just a few times, and you can count them on one hand, that you see Jesus getting frustrated with his disciples, with people around him. Only a few times. Now, that was for three and a half years. Now think back in your life, three and a half years, how many times have you been frustrated just with the person driving in front of you? <laughs> You've got to give Jesus a lot of credit. Driving next to you, yes. Listen, what this shows you is this just shows you what divine love really is and how patient God is. But humans in their fallen nature will take that patience and use it for license. Mm -hmm. Don't be one of those humans. Peter warned us about that. Just because God may work slowly, don't think he's slack concerning his promises. God is not slack concerning his promises, but God loves you enough to wait and give you time to repent and turn to him. Yeah. Thank you. I would say amen to that too, because if God was like me, 
Right? Can I use you? Sure. <laughs> if God was like us, I don't think there'd be anybody left here in this room but Ray and us. <coughs> Thank God he's not like us, right? Amen. If we could explain God fully, he'd fail to be God. Exactly. Exactly. So Habakkuk goes on and the Lord comes and he answers him. Now, mind you, Habakkuk is waiting to be what? Corrected. And the Lord answers him and says, write the vision. Make it plain on tablets. What does that mean, to make it plain on tablets? What did you say? So you can understand it, right? So it will be the same and that there will be no confusion. Did God write this in a way that it would be hidden in symbolism? That it would be dark and hard to understand? Or did he write it in a way that he tells the prophet, make it plain? So if he says make it plain, it should be in a way that we can understand it. Now I'm going to ask you, this vision that he's supposed to write, and make it plain. Was it just for their day, or does it have any application to our day today, to our time in history, and for us as a specific peculiar people? Amen. Would it mean yes? Yes. Okay. Now listen, I don't ask. Sometimes I ask rhetorical questions, but feel free to you know give me feedback. I love that. <coughs> don't don't be afraid to speak out. Then the Lord answered me and said, write the vision, make it plain on tablets. What do you think this means? I'm still trying to figure that out. <coughs> that he may run who read it. That doesn't sound too plain to me. What does that mean? Any ideas? Well, to answer that question, you have to figure out what the vision is. God already told him what he's going to do. I'm going to bring the Chaldeans. Now, are they somebody you're going to greet with a warm welcome? So do you think that God is trying to get the people's attention? Now listen, he already got Habakkuk's attention, right? And Habakkuk, he's having, hold that thought, he's having, he knows what's coming. He's having a hard time trying to digest what's coming, but he knows it. Okay, and so when you see something like this, that he may run to read it. What were you going to say, Deborah? Um, they used to have heralds that would take a message and run from place to place. That's what that means. Okay, I like that. Thank you very much. Did the people need to hear this? Yeah. Did most, the majority of the people believe that God was going to send the Chaldeans? No. Did they know they were on the doorstep? So did the heralds need to run and make this application? Why? Because to them it was going to be the end of their world. Right? <laughs> now I, I make that statement because I want you to see if there is an application to our day today with this message. This was an end of the world scenario. Life as you know it is going to come to an end. You need to be ready. You need to be warned. The heralds need to go out and proclaim the message. Is there an application to our day today? What has God raised up the Seventh-day Adventist Church to do? Isn't there not one, not two, but three angels' messages that have to be proclaimed? What are those messages for? It is to, to prepare a people for the end of the world. To prepare a people to meet and stand in the very presence of God Himself. Are the people ready? Do they know He's coming? Do they have any idea what's about to take place? There is very much similarity between this day, this culture, and our day. And it is the exact same thing God was wanting from Habakkuk and the people who claim God as their what he said to them he says to us now listen in the book of Revelation there is seven letters to seven churches 
And the last church in that seven letter is the church of who? Laodicea. Laodicea. And that last church is who? Are you sure about that? Yes. Is there any other church after that? No. Okay. And that church has a viewpoint of itself, and it sees itself very highly. And God has a viewpoint of that church, and it's like the total opposite of how they see themselves. What is the function of the church? What have you been established for? Spread the word. The end of all things is to preach the gospel message and to prepare. If you are the last church and there's no other church after you, then you are here to prepare a people for what is to come. When this church was raised up, that was what bound the people together and that's what lit their hearts on fire because they saw Jesus lifted up and they knew he was coming back. And a century and a half later, we see an institution. And we see ourselves as that proverbial fig tree that has a lot of leaves and no fruit. Yeah. Isn't that the church of Laodicea? You think you are rich? You're increased with goods? And yet, what is your real condition? So, we can say, well, yeah, the church as a whole, I see that. I agree with that. But what do you do when that message comes to you as an individual? Because the church is just a bunch of individuals. Is that right? And so, if that's how God sees the church, what's going to make sure that you're not that individual. Write the vision, make it plain, <coughs> excuse me, on tablets that he may run to read it. Now when you read what's going to happen, you may herald that and share it and prepare the people so they're not taken unawares. So that they're not left. Corey, can you catch me? I'm with you. <laughs> they're not left and caught in their sin. The worst state of any human being is thinking that you're saved, thinking that you're right with God, and getting to that last day and finding out that you're not. Because now, while you still have breath, you can repent. You get to that day, it's over with. It is done. But at the end, it will speak, <coughs> it will not lie, what will speak and what will not lie. And that is the vision, right? Ray, what, what Bible do you have? King James. Can you read chapter 2, I mean, uh, chapter 2, verse 2 and 3? Sure. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables, that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it. Stop. Again, it's a vision. It is going to happen. It's not going to happen right away. There's going to be a waiting period. But believe me, it's going to happen. Wait for it. Know that it's coming. And most of all, be ready. Be prepared, because it will come. It will not lie. Any application <coughs> between that and the church of legacy? Any application between that vision and the vision that somebody had while they were walking in the cornfield? Yeah. Remember that vision? Yeah. What was that vision? Jesus. They saw the... Um the sanctuary in heaven and the Ten Commandments with the Fourth Commandment was highlighted. And after who had that vision? It was after the great disappointment in 1844. 
was it uh, Hiram? Yeah. Hiram? Yeah. How do you say that first name? Hiram? Hiram. Hiram. Hiram Manson. Listen, you had in this country and around the world people heralding the second coming of Christ. He's going to come. He's going to come on this date. 1844. And October 22nd came and went, and Christ didn't come. Was the vision wrong? Was the word wrong? No. Wait for it. Though it tarries, wait. It will surely come to pass. It will not lie. Did something happen on that date? Absolutely. How do you know? Well, all you have to do is take the entire prophecy that is taken from in Daniel that speaks of the rebuilding of Jerusalem, the wall, that that will happen at a certain time, and then there will be a little more time, and then Messiah the Prince will come, and then a little more time after that he will be cut off, not for himself, but for his people. Does the vision end there? Because there's a whole lot more time after that. And so was... Jerusalem rebuilt right on schedule? Did the Messiah show up right on schedule? Yes. Did you ever wonder why he kept telling his mother, my time has not come? Mm -hmm. Not yet, my time has not come? He's thinking, well, I'm, I'm not ready to die yet. That wasn't it. Why do you think he told John the Baptist, baptize me because all righteousness needs to be fulfilled? Yeah. Was Jesus righteous? Yes. Was there any sin in him? No. He didn't need anything to be fulfilled in him. What was he talking about? He was talking about this time prophecy that's in the book of Daniel. He even told Judas at the perfect time, go do what you got to do. Every Adventist should be able to explain this. And if you can't explain it, at least know it because this is the foundation of your entire church system. Every belief that separates you from every other church is based off of this time prophecy. Is it accurate? Yes. When Jesus died, when Messiah was cut off, not for himself, did it happen at a specific day and time? To the second. Why do I say that? Because what was going on in the temple when he was expiring on the cross? The Passover lamb. Something that happened every year pointing to something that was going to come. And when it came, and he came, and he gave up his breath, what were they doing in the temple? <coughs> they were about to slaughter the Passover lamb. Now, when he died, what happened to the veil in the temple? It rent from top to bottom. Signifying what? That he was moving. That all those symbolic sacrifices have met their antitype in Jesus Christ and that there was no more need for animal sacrifices that everything the temple pointed to was hanging there on the cross did it happen at the exact time that God said it would thousands of years before it actually happened and the answer is what Carl Yes. Yes. You take that time prophecy, and at Jesus' death, that time prophecy still goes on. And it ends at a certain time. And if it's so accurate from the rebuilding of Jerusalem, from the start of Jesus' ministry to his crucifixion, don't you think it's just as accurate at the end? Amen. Wait for it. Amen. Though it tarry, it will not lie. It will come to pass. Mm -hmm. Did anything happen in 1844? Yes. 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 This is why you're Seventh-day Adventist. <coughs> what has God called you to do? To prepare a people to meet their Lord. You are Elijah. You are John the Baptist. You have a special message to prepare the people for the coming of their God. Amen. This is not just some old book written way back in the day that has no meaning on our life today. This is just 
as meaningful to us today as it was to Habakkuk and his people back then. So, Ray, can you continue on? Yes. Uh, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. It will not tarry. It will come to pass. So, has there been other prophecies that God has given that didn't happen exactly the way the people thought they would happen? Oh, absolutely. <coughs> Pretty much most of them. But we're going to look at one specific one, and that is the advent of the Messiah. When Jesus came, were the people ready to meet him? No. Who were the, actually the ones that actually showed up and worshipped him first? The Magi. Shepherds. Then the Magi, right? Shepherds. The shepherds, were they the high echelon of society back then? No. They were the bottom. Okay? They kept sheep. Doesn't take a lot of education to keep sheep. And yet, they were humble enough for angels to appear to them and herald the message that the Christ has come. When Jesus was growing up, did the people recognize him to be the Messiah? They knew he was different. Now that boy, there's just something different about him. Even the scribes and the Pharisees, when he was 12 years old, realized, man, there's something different about this young man. But when he came as an adult and he came on the scene, did they know he was their Messiah? He told them he was, right? And they didn't believe him. It's not that they didn't believe they didn't, it's not that they didn't believe him, they did not want him. They would have taken Barabbas. <coughs> but they didn't want the Christ. I gotta tell you what I'm doing is I'm looking for my glasses. I set them down somewhere and I put them right here. Eight pockets. Right 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 <laughs> I only have to wear them to see the words in the book. And if I wear them to look at you, you're all fuzzy. You know what I'm saying? So I have to take them off and put them in. Alright, turn with me to Philippians chapter 3. We're going to look at verses 3 through 11. Philippians chapter 3. Galatians, Ephesians, and then Philippians. <laughs> Philippians chapter 3. Habakkuk's told to write the vision down, to wait for it. There's going to be a time of waiting, but don't lose heart. Wait for it, it will surely come to pass. But at the end, it will speak, and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him. What does that mean, after you just got done listening to the vision, and to write it, uh, that it will not lie, nor when the appointed time comes, it will not tarry. What is this? Behold the proud. His soul is not upright in him. Any ideas on that one? The vision is going to be the Chaldeans coming and bringing God's judgment upon the Israelites for their hard-heartedness, for their rebellion against God. Who's he bringing? He's bringing a proud people who don't know God, who don't care about God, and yet God is choosing to use them, His special vessel of judgment. And I asked you when we looked at chapter 1, does God have the right to do this? Absolutely. Yes. Is God condoning the actions of the Chaldeans in using them as His rod of judgment? Yeah. No, of course not. What God is doing is the same thing He's done with Israel for centuries.